Okay, we have the recording. We're ready to go. Welcome to about, oh, 50 old lesbians. <laughs> Great. <laughs> nice even number. Um, welcome to the Gentleman Jack and Lister Zoom. I'm going to read the little blurb because I love I love the way what it says. And it really, I think it'll just help um, you get to know what's going to happen. So, um, all right, there I am. Well, I'm big now. All right, Gentleman Jack, the magnificent BBC HBO series that introduced Anne Lister to the world had an immense impact on lesbians. As a result of learning about the 19th century English first modern lesbian, women from all over the planet connected, shared their enthusiasm, and in some cases, even married each other. Eileen, Janet, and Amanda will share a few of their experiences as Lister sisters, I love that, and explain why the Anne Lister phenomena was and continues to be so powerful and life-changing. So I love that. I thought it was a great intro. And now I'm going to introduce to you oh, the three. The mm -hmm. three yeah. Is somebody not? Okay. I got it. I would I introduce to you the three presenters today. First, Janet Lee. Janet has sold hula hoops, organized armadillo races, and been suspect, suspected of being a CIA spy. And with that hat on, I don't know. She's lived in the American West in a VW van with a beagle puppy, dodged military checkpoints in, the, in Tibet, and camped out on the Great Wall of China. That must have been uncomfortable. Having escaped from 25 years in the crazy world of advertising, Janet now writes full-time. She is author of The Gentleman Jack Effect, Lesbians in Breaking Rules and Living Out Loud. She and her wife live in Santa Fe. Eileen Weatherall, I hope I'm saying your name right, Eileen. A world traveler, Eileen lived most of her life in Ireland, but worked in USA 10 years as a RN, 1977 to 1987. She also has done postgraduate work in women's studies. Eileen has multiple interests and is still a tomboy at heart. So am I. At 70, her body occasionally reminds her she's not in her 20s anymore. Eileen first heard of Anne Lister in the late 1990s when she saw a play in Dublin by Emma Donoghue, I Know My Own Heart, 1993, decades before the TV series Gentleman Jack. Okay, welcome. And Amanda Aikman. Amanda is a retired Unitarian Universalist minister who served churches in the Pacific Northwest for 25 years, following a career in advertising in New York City. She wrote over a dozen plays that have been produced in the Seattle area and is the author of the 2023 novel, Miss Lister's Guest House, based on the Ann Lister phenomena. Amanda lives with her partner in Everett, Washington. And Amanda and I, just personally, personal note, have been friends for 50 years. We're, we're about 51 years old now. No, about 50 <laughs> years. And um, she's she's my friend and she's been a mentor to me. And um, I'm really glad that she decided to do this panel. So, but oh, please welcome all three of our panelists today. Thank you very much for coming. Okay, take it away, Janet. First of all, thank you all for inviting us. We're delighted to be here and able to share our passion with you. Um, Mev, I guess you can throw up the slides now. You know, five years ago, I was minding my own business, leading my quiet little retirement life in Santa Fe with my wife of 40 years, and then something uh, unexpected and unthinkable happened. I fell in love with another older woman and my life got turned upside down. But lucky for me, she was 228 years old and um, well dead. So this is what happened to me as a result of watching Gentleman Jack. Uh, next. As you've already heard, Gentleman Jack was an HBO a BBC TV production that actually aired for the first time five years ago. It's it's still on uh, HBO Max and Amazon Prime for those of you who haven't seen it who might be interested. Um, one of the things that's so wonderful about that show is that the production values are really terrific 
And uh, I think most of us who have seen it would agree it's probably one of the best lesbian themed uh, TV shows that we've ever seen. It's the love story between Ann Lister and Ann Walker, the wealthy heiress who lived, uh, you know, close by that Miss Lister intended to marry. Now, keep in mind, this was in 1832. Uh, next. One of the reasons the show was so compelling, of course, is that who wouldn't want to watch these beautiful women for eight hours and then another series of eight more hours? But one of the reasons it's compelling even more than the people who played the lead actors is that it's based on a real person. It's based on historical Ann Lister and Ann Walker, uh, who really were both quite ahead of their time. Uh, next, Mev. Ann Lister was a, a landowner when most women did not own property. She was an adventurer. She traveled around the world. She uh, was completely unconventional. She liked to dress in men's clothing. She really turned heads wherever she was. And one of the things that she's really known for these days is that she wrote a diary. She kept a, dry, a diary. She wrote almost every day for 23 years. In her diary, uh, Mev Next, she she wrote in what she called the plain hand, and you'll see that on the top part of the screen. Her handwriting is very, very small, but um, at the bottom, you'll see that it looks like a very weird scrawl. That's what she called her crypt hand. It's all done in a code that she and her first girlfriend uh, developed when they were 14 years old in boarding school. So Anne wrote every day. She wrote, you know, about normal things. She wrote about the weather. She wrote about what she ate. She wrote about what she did, where she went. But what she also did in her secret code is she wrote about her uh, emotions and she wrote about her love affairs with women. So uh, much of this remained hidden until the uh, 1930s or so when uh, more of this was widely known. As I said, she was very prolific. She wrote 24 volumes, more than 5 million words. And really until just as a result of Gentleman Jack, all of those diaries have now been transcribed. Next. When I saw Gentleman Jack, I have to admit, I was, I was obsessed. I mean, it was embarrassing how crazy it made me. I, um, I watched the show over and over. I um, got involved in social media, which I had never, ever done before. I, I thought I was losing my mind, quite frankly, and I thought maybe I wasn't the only one. So I conducted a survey on Facebook. I posted a questionnaire and I asked for people to just kind of give me their impressions of Gentleman Jack. And I hoped I'd get 75 responses and I got 600. And the net result was that I wasn't the only one obsessed that there were a lot of people who really couldn't quite put their finger on why they were having such an extreme reaction to a TV show. It, it was crazy enough for me that I decided I had to go to Halifax, which is Ann Lister's hometown in Northern England and check it out for myself. I really wanted to walk in Ann's footsteps and see really what was so compelling about all of this. Next. After my visit to Halifax and meeting with other like-minded crazy people, I decided there really was a story to be told about why this television show was having such a dramatic effect. So during the COVID pandemic, I interviewed people around the world. There are 69 stories in my book from people in 16 countries. Almost all are women, most are lesbians. And it was really very interesting what I discovered. Uh, next. The overriding thing that emerged from all of these stories and all these interviews was this belief that, you know, if Ann Lister could be the way she was and do what she did 200 years ago, then certainly we could have the courage and the confidence to do the same thing. So the overriding theme that kept showing up in, in, in these interviews was this whole thing about having confidence, being courageous, and it manifested itself in interesting ways. You know, the, People came out for the first time. They changed jobs. They moved. They got out of relationships that were, were not fulfilling to them. They decided to wear what they wanted to wear, get their hair cut the way they wanted it done. It was very transformative just in terms of people, especially in our age group, realizing that there is nothing wrong with us and we should celebrate who we are. 
The other thing that happened was people wanted to do what Ann Lister did. She climbed a mountain in the Pyrenees for the first, she was the first person to climb it, man or woman, in 1838. And so 15 women got together and said, you know, if Ann can climb a mountain, so can we. Of course, COVID put an end to all of that. But what did come out of it was uh, two marriages, two of the two sets of couples <laughs> fell in love as a result of planning to climb a mountain. And so now they're climbing a mountain together. Uh, which is kind of really wonderful. The other thing, uh, next, Mev, the other thing that happened was that people became armchair detectives. All of a sudden, people were a lot more interested in 19th century England than they are in the 21st century. People started making new friends online. People began to have all kinds of forms of creative expression. Uh, one woman in South Carolina built a house uh, a replica of Shipden out of Legos, not making this up. Another woman um, developed an Ann Lister Monopoly game. Lots of artists, lots of people wrote books. And of course, another thing that happened is that people were so interested in what Ann Lister actually had to say that more than 100 people volunteered to transcribe her journals for the first time. The archivist in West Yorkshire, where the archive, where the uh, journals are actually kept, estimated it would take something like 30,000 hours in 10 years to decode all of those uh, diaries that Ann Lister wrote, and the code breakers got it done in two years. Uh, next. The other thing that happened was the sense of community developed, and overall, you know, one of the things that I think emerged from this that, you know, we take for granted sometimes is that we're not often seen on television. And the idea that we would be positively represented, that lesbians would be in a love story on mainstream television was really a dramatic impact. And the result of that was for many, it was very transformative. Here are some examples. Self-realization kind of emerged. The, the women that you see in this picture, the, the woman on the left, is actually English and she watched Gentleman Jack on uh, a DVD. And she, at the end of it, she said, oh, well, that explains everything. I must be a lesbian. So she quit her job as a dentist. She sold her house. She moved to West Yorkshire uh, to Gentleman Jack territory and uh, met this woman that's in the picture with her online who was Hungarian, who then moved to England and they got married. That's just one of the examples of things that happened. But one of the things that uh, she told me was she said, Gentleman Jack changed my life. Coming to terms with who I am and whom I love is such a relief because it makes sense of everything in my life. I think watching this show was affirmative also for a lot of us. Uh, in the middle is my friend Jane Kendall. And Jane is one of the uh, transcribers. I mean, I think she's transcribed close to 2,000 pages of Anne's journals. And what, what Jane said to me was, what many of us have gained from Gentleman Jack and Ann Lister is a powerful affirmation of our own struggles and a strengthened resolve to continue trying every day to be our authentic selves. The validation thing also is a key factor in, in the reactions that people had to Gentleman Jack. And uh, the woman on the right is... Um, Jane Finn. She was uh, one of the ministers at the uh, church in Halifax where Ann Lister went to church and was buried and uh, married and all of that. Anyway, what Jane said, which I thought was really pretty amazing, was she said, Ann's voice is the voice I expect God to have, constantly reminding us to be sure to be ourselves. Ann calls to us to live our best lives and be our true selves. And I think that, that's kind of what came out of the whole experience for, for all of us who were so taken with Gentleman Jack. It's okay to be who we are. It's okay to live openly and to be authentic. And those of us, I think, uh, in our age group know what it's like to uh, struggle with that. Also, I think what Ann Lister did, especially for her hometown in Halifax, it it inspired this incredible sense of pride in that community for their, you know, their favorite daughter. And I think the same reaction happened with people who were drawn to the program. We're proud of who we are. We have nothing to hide. I, I just want to read you what I wrote in the conclusion to my book, because I think it's pretty telling. And it sums up really what I learned in this process of talking to so many people around the world. Um, 
This is in a chapter called Catalyst for Change. And I really think that's what Ann Lister did through this program about her. A lot of it was of course fictionalized, but since it was based on a true story, it really had some resonance. But what I found was this, our fervent emotional identification with Ann and her defiance in terms of the norms of her day is life affirming to all of us who have been misunderstood, ashamed, rejected, punished, criticized, ridiculed, abused, maligned, misgendered, or relegated to living half-lives in the shadow simply for how we look and or whom we love. For lesbians, Ann Lister is the mentor we've never had, an indomitable pathfinder to help us navigate and celebrate being like that. The enduring impact of the Gentleman Jack effect is ultimately about the connections generated to ourselves, to one another, and to the past. The show emboldened women, regardless of their sexual identity, to throw off self-imposed restraints and fully be themselves, capable, strong, assertive, resilient, and proud. Next. So for me, of course, one of the reasons I wanted to write the book is I thought surely that would give me an opportunity to meet Sir Ann Jones, who played Ann Lister in the Joe and Jack series, and I did. And also it connected me with a community of women through the Ann Lister birthday week. If those of you are, if anybody's watching from England, the uh, third annual get together is coming up in a couple of weeks. It'll be April 3rd through uh, 7th in Halifax. And it continues to connect all of us who were sort of half crazed by Gentleman Jack. Um, it's been a lot of fun talking to you today about my book. And um, I'm gonna turn this over now to Eileen Weatherall because she has a lot of stories herself to tell. Thanks. Hi everyone, can you hear me? I can't get any feedback. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. We were That's all muted right. trying to say yes to you. <laughs> okay. Lovely. Lovely. Okay. Well, great. So many of you have turned out and we've been really looking forward to this. Um, I've been on a number of Olaf Zooms. Some of you may have seen me before. And I don't think I've been on one that I haven't actually mentioned. And um, Mr. Gentleman Jack. So, you know, it's... Um, an interest of mine, I won't say I'm obsessed, but I do read part of her diaries almost every day. So just a little bit obsessed. Anyway, I'm going to tell you a bit about my story, but I want to fit it in with um, the stories of other people involved in um, the creation of um, Gentleman Jack. And so I mentioned Sally Wainwright, who is a BBC producer, director, who actually wrote the script for Gentleman Jack. And she grew up near Halifax and um, is very, very supportive of the whole Amnesty community, comes to the annual Amnesty Birthday Weeks, of which I'm going to go to on the 28th of March. It will be my third one. And I met Janet and Amanda as previous ones. So, um, Helen Whitbread and Emma Donahue are two others. Helena, a very interesting story, and some of you might have seen um, a documentary on her life. And I'm proud to say she calls herself 100% Irish because both of her parents and families had emigrated from Ireland somebody is to not, work in... Somebody is not me? muted. Somebody is not muted in it. In the... Actually, I'm... everyone is muted, but unfortunately, Eileen is in a cafe, so that's the noise you're hearing. Yeah. I'm oh, actually okay, speaking sorry. to you from Guatemala, and the Wi-Fi in my house went out, so I had to run around and get a cafe. So please stick with me. I'm doing my best. Anyway... So Helena, who is very proud to call herself 100% Irish, 
She left school at the age of 13, uh, mostly for health reasons, but um, she got a chance later in life to finish her education, uh, go to college, and for someone who left school at 13, she has an MBE. I don't know how many of you know what an MBE is, but it's, um, it's quite an honor presented by no less than King Charles, a member of the excellent order, the empire, blah, blah. She has also got a doctor of letters, as you can see from the University of Sheffield. Now, the reason I'm starting with Helena, who actually wrote two books about Anne um, Lister called The Secret Diaries. And um, the first was also, um, thank you. I Know My Own Heart. And then the second, well, the first she wrote in 1988. And I met her shortly after then, actually, because she came to UCD, University College Dublin, where there was an annual conference called Lesbian Lives Conference. I don't know if any of you have heard of it, international conference, people come from all over the world presenting on different aspects of lesbian lives. Anyway, Helena came, and that was the first time I'd ever heard of Anne Lister. So that was, we'll say approximately 1990. Well, Helena's book inspired an Irish author called Emma Donoghue, which some of you may have heard of. Emma now lives in Canada with her partner, Chris Wilson, and they have children there, but she makes frequent visits back to her family in Ireland. And uh, I actually saw her about six months ago. She was promoting her new book, Learned by Heart, um, which is about the relationship between Anne Lister and her first lover, partner, called Eliza Rain. Some of you may have read that book. So anyway, there's three brilliant books to start with for anyone who wants to do any further research. Um, Helena's two and Emma's learned by heart. So um, the book in 1988 that Helena wrote was published by Virago. And um, it's actually based on the journals of Van Lister with many quotes. So I'm just going to give you a few quotes just to give you an idea. I love and only love the fairer sex and thus I'm loved by them. That's one of her quotes from 1821. And another one. I am neither man or woman in society. How shall I manage? And then the one that a lot of us um, found very inspiring and helpful was um, that God had made her like this and therefore she could accept herself, which has helped a lot of Lister sisters to accept themselves. And um, I mean, they're, obviously the books are um, full of a lot more from her journals. The second one, actually, No Priest But Love. Um, it's the second of the Secret Diaries of Anne Lister. Um, is centered around a relationship that she had in Paris with a woman called Maria Barlow, who was from the Channel Islands, but lived in Paris. And Anne was a frequent visitor and in fact, rented an apartment in Paris, which she used whenever she was there. Her aunt, who was also called Anne, her aunt Anne, and she spent quite a bit of time in Paris as well. And um, <laughs> as to the quote about how would Anne Lister ma manage, well, um, as Janet just mentioned, Anne dressed partly in men's clothing. She wore a skirt, a long skirt, 
and uh, on the top half, a cravat, shirt, um, a shirt, waster, and coat, all in black. After having had a couple of broken hearts of relationships with women who ended up marrying men, she, she decided she'd kind of go into mourning. And for the rest of her life, she wore black, apart from one famous occasion. She was actually in Denmark. And through connections with uh, aristocratic, well to do friends, she was invited to the birthday of the Queen of. Denmark <laughs> and it was compulsory that everyone wore white so that's the only time that she ever wore anything other than black okay as you can see in the picture there that's Emma Donahue at her book promotion in Dublin it was in the Unitarian Church Amanda and I are both Unitarians and uh, I was dressed in my black top hat and gear and she wrote a really beautiful um message in my book um, to one lister sister from another with love. So I treasure that book. Okay, moving on to the next slide. So here you see on the left, myself and another of the regular Lister sisters, an Irish woman called Una Walsh. Una lives in Galway, the other side of Ireland. To me, I live in County Wicklow, which is on the east coast. She lives on the west coast. And we became friends through meeting in Halifax at the Anister Birthday Week. And the building that we are in was actually a hotel that Anister visited in 1826. It's now offices, um, and we were doing a kind of um, run through for a tour that we decided together to do of Amnesty's Dublin and to recreate her trip from 19, from 1826, July of 1826, when she and Mariana, who was one of the greatest loves of her life, Mariana Lawton, married to Charles Lawton. That's another whole story. And um, Mr. Duffin started that journey with him, who was also Irish. Anyway, to go back to, we were doing a recce and Louise and I were on the doorstep um, having a look at the building and the door opened and the woman who managed the building came out and we told her why we were there and she invited us in and gave us a tour of what was the hotel beautifully restored. The um, wooden panels on the right, which are now painted, were the original from way back then. And the staircase, the actual steps are replaced, but the handrails and everything are literally from the 19th century. So that was the first stop on our tour. So um, in the picture on the right, we're in Trinity College in Dublin. We have 10 people doing the tour with us. Una is at one side in her skirt blowing in the wind. It absolutely lashed rain, cats and dogs the whole time. And on the far right is Bridge, who was also at the first Alistair birthday week. And I'm beside Bridge under that umbrella, which is actually from the Halifax Minster in Halifax and Yorkshire. Anyway, so Trinity was the second stop because in her journals, and Mr. talked about her visit to Trinity and behind us we have the library where the famous Book of Cows is. If you haven't visited Ireland or haven't visited the Book of Cows, you've probably heard of it. And that is the building that was built to house it. And um, all of us went up to see the Book of Cows and to tour the library. And one of the things that she mentioned was a part that was um, played by Brian Roof, and it is there. Anyway, after we went to Trinity College, 
we went to what used to be the first parliament in Dublin, which is now Bank of Ireland. And then we went to Dublin Castle. And from Dublin Castle, we went into the chapel, which she, I mean, this woman was uh, a woman for detail. Not only in her journal did she mention what the temperature was every day and what her bowel movements were sometimes, but she um, wrote incredible details every single day in her journal. And so we read at each place we went to the extracts from her journal. And um, so in the chapel at Trinity College, once again, she described the whole architecture, Gothic, etc., and then Christchurch Cathedral. So moving on to the next slide, I'm not quite sure how much time I have left. But one of the things that I love to do when I'm in Halifax at the Analyst of Earth Week, I join the choir. And the choir mistress on the left is Janneke from Holland. And we're from a number of different countries, including Ireland, England, um, Holland, America, and Germany. And here we are singing two songs which um, Anne Lister sang in her day. And one of them was called Hail to the Chief. You can Google these. And the other one is Ave Verum Corpus in Latin. So um, that was a bit of a challenge for people who didn't know Latin. But there is actually a video available of us singing those two songs. And this year, on the birthday, which is April the 3rd, after the flower lane in front of the statue of our mister in the Peace Hall in the center of Halifax, we're going to be singing from the Messiah. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, how am I doing for time? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm not hearing back, but this is the last slide. You have about two more minutes, so okay? One of two the more minutes, Eileen. I've been inspired by um, Mr. Sally Wainwright, Helena Whitbread, and Emma Donahue is to, I actually won a fancy dress competition in County Wicklow, where I live in the south of Ireland, and uh, I dressed up as, guess who? Um, Mr. Gentleman John. Um, so there are so many other things I could talk about, um, but I'll give um, Amanda time to talk about her book. And if anyone has any other questions, I'm more than happy to talk about them. Basically, I would be very inspired as others that Janet has talked about. Last year, there were 18 different nationalities in ALBW, but there are so many more from around the world on the Facebook pages. And um, literally, probably 75 countries, I think some counted. Okay, I'm going to hand over now to Amanda and thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thanks, Eileen, for overcoming a lot of obstacles to talk to us today. I would like to start with memories from when I came out, a scary and exhilarating time. 1974, Rhett Scazzillo and I met at college on Long Island playing field hockey, and we came out together in our senior year. It was a scary time to come out but we soon discovered where the lesbians were on Long Island and enjoyed the solidarity and comradeship. We were very lucky. There was a great lesbian bar called TC and Company in Hempstead, and we danced and drank there every weekend. And the high point for me personally was in 1984, my play, the first play I'd written, <laughs> The Lavender Elephant premiered there at the bar. Most of the audience had never seen a romance between women portrayed. So whenever the actresses kissed, there was a lot of hooting and hollering. <clears throat> also on Long Island, we had Woman Made Products, lesbian bookstore, which sponsored an awesome monthly discussion group. 
we saw concerts in New York City with Chris Williamson, Alex Dobkin. We had festivals. And above all, and most important, every summer, we had softball. So we had a multifaceted lesbian community. And then in 1983, I moved to Roanoke, Virginia, an incredibly homophobic environment. But to my delight, there was an amazing lesbian group there called First Friday. First Friday, besides getting together to drink beer on the first Friday of every month, they also sponsored an annual camp weekend in the fall, which was about as close to heaven as I've ever been. From that whole era, I remember above all the ecstasy of dancing, dancing to Donna Summer or Gloria Gaynor in a crowd of women, a sweaty, laughing, gorgeous crowd. My life took me away from lesbian community for a long time. I went to seminary when I was in my mid thirties and I became a Unitarian Universalist minister. I met a wonderful woman after I'd moved to Washington State, where I now live. I met a wonderful woman to whom I am now married. Nancy has many virtues, but she was never at all interested in lesbian community. Nobody's perfect. My work was very intense. And although the UU Church was very welcoming, I still felt pretty closeted because of my professional role. And lesbian community had become much less energizing for me since mainstreaming of gay culture. And then more recently, the inclusion of people who identify as lesbians without having the same life experiences as female born lesbians. I lost a big part of my identity and my enthusiasm. And I didn't even realize a part of me had checked out and gone to sleep. My sexuality and my experience of lesbian community kind of went to sleep for a couple of decades. And then in 2019, something wonderful happened. Gentleman Jack came on TV, watching it galvanized me, woke me up. I became like a lot of other people, like Janet said, I became obsessed with all things Ann Lister. Lesbians who watched Gentleman Jack had a common experience. I would call it a sexual reawakening. And through Facebook, I connected with women all over the world. It was very joyful. And then so exciting meeting so many of our online friends in person at the first Ann Lister birthday week in 2022 in Halifax. At our festival there, I met young women who had never before experienced lesbian community. I remember mentioning something about my coming out experience and the lesbian bars and a young woman who heard me said so wistfully that it broke my heart. What was that like? It made me so sad that they're not able to access the joy of lesbian community as I had known it. So Gentleman Jack unleashed a lot of big feelings as Janet said, some women fell in love with each other, some dove into research about Ann Lister, some traveled around retracing her steps through Europe. I wrote a fanfic. A fanfic, fan fiction, is the lowest form of literature, really, but I put a lot of love into it. There was a... Oh, I'm not ready for that yet. Oh, well, anyway. I wrote a fanfic. So there was this huge, passionate reaction to my little story. If you're not familiar with fan fiction, you, they come out like a serial kind of. So I, I put out a, a chapter every week or so. Had this huge, passionate reaction to my little story. It was very rewarding and an amazing way to connect emotionally with readers. But then when I published the last chapter, it was over and after only just a couple of weeks, it was it had just disappeared as if, like when you throw a pebble into a pond. I didn't have too much going on as I had just retired. 
I had given up playwriting, which by the way, is a real pain in the ass, playwriting. And I gave up playwriting and thought maybe I could try my hand at writing a novel. Kids, don't try this at home. <laughs> Took a lot of energy. I started one. I started a novel based on the idea that there was a movie about Ann Lister, a movie in my book, not a TV show. It's like a, an alternate reality. So the idea that there had been a movie about Ann Lister and an American woman named Devon becomes a fan and falls in love with an English Ann Lister fan. And subsequently, Devon moves from California to Yorkshire and sets up a bed and breakfast, a guest house, excuse me, catering to the Ann Lister fans who were coming to Yorkshire. Excuse me. I called my novel Miss Lister's Guest House. And now we can see the cover, please. This beautiful cover created by my sister, who said she never draws people, but by God, she drew a lovely person. So there's the guest house and the fields of Yorkshire in the background. Well, friends, my first draft was absolutely awful. It was just a bunch of sexual encounters and was just bad. A friend who read that awful first draft encouraged me to find the story's heart. And she asked me what my heart's desire was. So I reflected very deeply and realized the story's heart and my own heart was not so much about romance as about creating lesbian community. My main character in the rewrite finds herself healing and growing as she connects women through friendship and eventually creates a community centered around the bed and breakfast. I had so many characters because of all the women who come to stay at the guest house and all their romantic partners and all this and their dog. I had so many characters, even I was losing track. So I hired an illustrator to create little icons of each character. Could we see that picture? There we go. And none of them have faces. You could project your own face onto them, but readers have said this was quite, quite helpful. In the upper left-hand corner, you see a picture of Celia who is portraying Ann Lister in the movie that they were all crazy about. So thank you, thank you. I'd like to say that, well, at that point, I started yearning once again for lesbian community, which to me means a community of adult human females who are attracted to members of the same sex. As you may know, that is very difficult to find these days. It can be risky even to talk about it. And I felt as if I was back in the closet again. Through Facebook groups, I have met women around the world who are fighting for true lesbian space, including in places such as Tasmania, Australia. In Tasmania, it is actually, hi Joanne, actually, it's actually illegal to hold a public single sex event. Finally, last summer, I connected with a real life group in my area, a secret lesbian group. Group, Life was exciting again. This group has a long acronym that is impossible to pronounce. I will call it Pinwheel. At Labor Day, this past Labor Day, I went to my first pinwheel camp at a, Christian campsite that we were able to uh, rent, nice place with buildings. It was an absolute joy to meet women from all over the Northwest who are united in their longing for lesbian community. The group is very intentionally multi-generational. So there were women there as young as 19 and as old as 82. As with any new group, it's a bit of a struggle to keep the momentum going. So I planned a party for February a couple of weeks ago with the sole purpose of getting together to play games and experience some silly fun together because we get too serious lesbians, we get too damn serious. So 22 women came and we had a blast. Besides the games I had planned, women spontaneously 
started to do their own thing. And I think the moment I'll remember the most fondly was a young woman starting an arm wrestling competition and taking on all comers. Everybody laughing their heads off, but also sweating and taking it seriously. It was a wonderful moment. So I have Ann Lister to thank for this. And where even just a few months ago, I felt some despair, I now have high hopes that the tide is turning. All over the world, women are waking up and pushing back to create single sex spaces where women in general and lesbians in particular can feel safe, affirmed, and joyful. I hope that we can all be an active part of this joyful re-emerging, creating spaces, groups, and a world where along with our great ancestor, Ann Lister, we can proudly say, I love and only love the fairer sex. Thank you, Olak women, for the beautiful community you have created and for inviting me today. Blessed be, and now back to Mev.